we're going to talk about, we're moving into Acts chapter 6. We'll touch just a couple, uh, one or two verses at the end of chapter 5 as we move into chapter 6. And this morning we're going to be talking about seven servants from Acts, God's unfinished book, seven servants. When we last left the apostles two weeks ago, they had been arrested, they had been accused, they had been beaten, they had been threatened. And they left the meeting rejoicing. They left the meeting rejoicing, not that they had been beaten, but that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace. Let's look at Acts 5, 41 and 42 as we move into our message this morning. And I, I think that's so important for us because as Christians, we kind of get it mixed up sometimes, I think. We look at, we, we, on one side, we push away, some people push away all trouble and say, I'm a Christian, I should always, I shouldn't have trouble, I should always over, overcome, I shouldn't face these things. And then sometimes on the other side, there, there's the, and that's wrong. And then on the other side, there's also the feeling like it's, it's a trial. Lord, thank you for this trial. Lord, thank you for this persecution. Sorry. Lord, thank you for this suffering. Thank you for this. And I don't believe that's right. And I don't think that's what the Bible tells us either. Because if you say, oh, thank you for all, for all of this, this hardship, that's kind of like being a masochist. And that's kind of, I, 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 love, I love pain. I love this. I, I love that. And, and if it's from God, it's got to be hard. I don't think the Bible teaches that as well. And if that's how we feel, we need to get it straight. We need to get it straight with God's Word and, and get our thinking straight. So as we look at the apostles, we, we get a good perspective on suffering. And that's not our focus. That's not our message this, this morning. But look with me as we move into this message this morning. They rejoiced that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. There is, their there is the rejoicing. And brothers and sisters, there is our rejoicing as well. How could they rejoice in this? And I want us to see this. They rejoiced that God had counted them worthy. And as we look at it and as we consider it, here is something for us as well. Remember the two times before when they stood before the high council. Remember what Peter and John said the first time? They said, you judge for yourselves whether we should obey God or man. As for ourselves, we cannot. We, we have to keep saying. We have to keep talking. And then this time as well, they said, in effect, the same thing. We must obey God rather than man. And that struck me as I was preparing and moving into the message. <gasps> The devil did not do that, by the way. <laughs> keep, our, keep our focus and get back to it. Um, where was I? Maybe the devil <laughs> did do it. Um, as, we, as we consider this and as we look at this, this gives, us, this gives us a way to look at troubles and persecution for the, sake of, for the sake of righteousness. It's not just, okay, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian, but I want us to see something deeper. The apostles had received from Jesus truth and inspiration. And he, it was clear that the Holy Spirit had put in their hearts a living word. And I want us to see that this morning. It was a living word that gripped their hearts and that changed their outlook. You and I, as we face trouble, as we face difficulties, as we face disappointments, Personally, I think it is we have the Word of God, but God does something more there because we have the Holy Spirit. We have God the Holy Spirit. We have the written Word. And what the Holy Spirit does as we go through trials and as we look to Him and as we hold on to Him, the Holy Spirit takes the written Word. It is the inspired Word of God. But he takes the written word. And then as you and I seek God in these tough times, the Holy Spirit takes that word, lifts it, breathes on it, makes it alive in our lives. And as he makes it alive in our lives, we can then face troubles and trials and go through those not based on, I am a Christian and so I know that I must do this. 
We have very little strength in that. That's kind of a willpower thing, isn't it? But we go through tough times and trials knowing, oh God, you have spoken to me. Lord, you have worked in my heart and in my life. And God, I will make it. I rejoice in you. Let me give you an example. This morning, as we were singing, praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. How many of you, facing some things that you are facing, had in your heart and in your spirit this morning, you had a lift, a, a faith, and it wasn't feeling, it, it touched your feelings, it touched your emotions, but it was more than an emotional thing and more than a feeling. It came from the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit touching you, speaking you, remind, speaking to you, reminding you and encouraging you again that God is your victory. He has won the victory and you were strengthened for what is ahead. Amen? Amen. That is a, that's an example, uh, a small example of what we see here. They were able to go through this very difficult time. It wasn't just a little spanking that they received uh, in the high council. It was a flogging. It was a flogging. And generally, a flogging was 39 lashes, as Jesus received. We don't know if it was less. It could be less. But it certainly would have been something that would have caused them to bleed greatly and skin torn and clothes messed up and broken. And we look at this, they walk out in victory. They left rejoicing, not that they had been beaten, but that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace. What the High Council had done to punish them brought them joy. What the High Council had done to shame them instead honored them before God. What the High Council had done to intimidate and silence them instead emboldened them from house to house every day, and even in the temple, the lion's den, if you will, in the lion's den, to teach and preach and proclaim the message, Jesus is the Messiah, the very message for which they had been arrested and beaten. Brothers and sisters, we must have this from God to make it in a world that is not of God and is opposed to God in His ways. Amen? Amen. And we can. And we can. Amen. And so, so much for the enemy's attack on the church in, in this section. It started chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira struck dead because of their hypocrisy and their attempt to deceive the church and lie to the Holy Spirit. And God dealt with that summarily, very, very quickly. And then here came this attack. And this morning we're going to look at another threat to the church. But let's look at the threat to the church by talking about it uh, in another way as we begin. How many of you are parents and your children, especially around the age of four or five, or again in their early teens, have your children ever complained of aches and pains? Yes or no? Oh, I remember when I was a young teen, I'd come in from school and I found out more about it. It's common late afternoon, I'd come in from school and I would complain, my legs, my thighs would just ache. I mean, they really, they would, they would just ache. And I would complain to my mother, and say, it hurts, it hurts. And my mother, bless her heart, loved me very much. But you know what mom would do? She looked at me, you know what she would say? You have growing pains. You have growing pains. Now, I don't know how, how uh, scientific that diagnosis is, but you have growing pains. I was this size and I was going to this size. You have growing pains. And she didn't take me to the doctor, and I survived. And, and here I am. Here I, here I am today. And I was thinking about that as we talk about our message this morning, because we are going to look at growing pains in the new church in the new church this morning. So here's this new church full of the Holy Spirit, full of love, full of prayer, characterized by a wonderful sacrificial unity among the members, and it's growing rapidly. It's growing rapidly. Now, let me ask you something. Look around at Lighthouse. We're in second service. Uh, first service has already taken place. Here we are in the second service. Kids are up in Sunday school. Uh, we have quite a few people already in the Philippines for the medical mission for the anniversary today at Pastor Rowena's and the medical mission that begins tomorrow. But we're around 200, roughly. Let me ask you something. What if, in say six or seven months, we at Lighthouse grew 
from 200, our present size, to about 2,000. Praise the Lord! <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? But accompanying such growth would be some growing pains, right? Think about some of the growing pains that we would have. Now, we laughed about it in the first service, but if it really happened to us, some things we wouldn't be laughing about so very much. The services would be packed. How many of you are a little bit warm at the end of us of singing and praising the Lord this morning? When Lighthouse gets really full on the fourth, here on the second floor, and the seats are packed and we're really worshiping the Lord, it gets pretty warm in here, doesn't it? Especially right back in there. <laughs> right back in there. Imagine packed out. It'd be pretty warm in here. How many of you on Sunday morning uh, coming up or especially at, after the first service, you want to go out and eat and the elevators are full and you've got to wait and wait and wait for the elevator? That's a small growing pain, right? That's a small one. Here's another one. Sorry, gentlemen, you're okay. But ladies, how often between the services or right before the service do you have to wait in line for the restroom at Lighthouse? Many of us do. Imagine 2,000 people, many of them women. The line would be long then. Or think about, I'd like to talk with the pastor, but she's talking with them. I, I, I'll never get to talk with pastor. Look at all these people. Here's another one. You come in, but you come in a little bit late one Sunday morning, and somebody is sitting in your chair. Your chair. Your chair. Now, we are such good Christians. None of us have our favorite chair that we own and we claim, right? We laughed in the first service because Brother Kim pointed to his wife, Sister May Ka, right back there where Clarice and her daughter are, are sitting. And I said, but how many of you get upset when somebody sits in your chair? And May said, <laughs> like that. But you know, honestly, a lot of us don't like it when we thought, that's my space. That's my chair, right? <laughs> Believe me, if we had 2,000 people in Lighthouse, somebody would get your chair. <laughs> somebody would get your space. Now, these are small growing pains. But what we're going to look at this morning is a much more serious growing pa pain. Because my, my math is really bad. You know I'm a words person, not a numbers person. Because the difference in growth was from about 120 people at the beginning to roughly 10,000 in the space of seven or eight months. That's what most, most Bible scholars say the growth was in that first year. So 120 to about 10,000. Now you've got growing pains. And there were 12 apostles. There was no deacon board. There were, there were no various whatever. There were 12 apostles for a church of 10,000. So we can imagine. We can think about that. And let's look. Let's read in Acts chapter 6. Here we read uh, Acts chapter 6, verses 1, just verse 1 at first. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were murmurs or rumblings of discontent. That word, murmurs or rumbling, it's a really bad word, by the way. It's also used in the Old Testament. Remember when they were in the wilderness and they were going through the desert and they didn't like the food and they didn't like Moses and they didn't like his leadership and it was hot and they were tired of manna and they started to murmur. Um, it's exactly this word and the idea is it's not open, it's, under, it's behind the back and it's underneath and, it's, and it spreads. And it's a, in the Bible, it's a bad word. It's a bad word. So it begins this way. There were rumblings of Greek content. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So now we come to a point, chapter 5, two threats to the church, Ananias and Sapphira. Boom! God deals with them, strikes them dead. He's going to keep his church pure and holy, and he wants his people to know, this is how I feel about sin. And this is still what happens in our hearts and in our lives when we choose deliberately to sin in this way. God wants us to know that. Ananias and Sapphira were an example and a parable, a lesson for you and for me as well. But God deals with that decisively. Outside persecution, they're arrested, they're beaten, they're threatened, and they stand strong. Now we come to chapter 6, and here we have a serious threat indeed, because this threat could split the church almost in half. 
And we wouldn't just have the first church of Jerusalem of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd then have also the second church of Jerusalem of the Lord Jesus Christ if things could not work out, if things could not be worked out. And so there's a serious threat to the church. Do you know, I, I praise the Lord for Lighthouse and for the spirit of unity we have, but I will tell you this, there have been times over the years at Lighthouse when there have been threats, when there have been rumblings, if you will, of discontent, and we've had to deal with them. And some of you might say, what? I, I haven't heard that. I, I, I didn't know about that. I, everything is fine. As long as there is a God's church in this world, the enemy is going to attack the church of God. He's going to attack the church of God. And so we stand firm and stand strong. And this, and this story gives us, gives us some, some weapons and some tools as we look at this. And so, don't look. They'll turn it off. So here comes this threat. Greek speaking on one side, Hebrew speaking believers. Now for us to understand what's going on, if my brain were stronger, it would not distract me, <laughs> but it does. And so here are these two groups on either side, and we need to understand what's going on. So the Greek-speaking believers complain, our widows, the ones that are part of our group, they're being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Now you know here at Lighthouse, we love to eat together, we love to have potlucks, and you know, Pastor Renee years ago coined the expression, Christian portions, right? And we all laugh, but we know what that means, right? Christian portions. Um, last Monday at Crossroads, uh, Andreas, and I helped him a little bit, but he kindly ensured that we had Christian portions at Crossroads. Sometimes we need help with Christian portions. Um, but what we look at here is much more serious than that. It is not that somebody was at the front of the line and they got more shrimp and sushi and there wasn't enough for, for everybody else in the back of the line. It was more serious than that because the widows, many times uh, they would have, um, especially the, the Greek-speaking widows, they would have lived in other parts of Asia. They would have come to Jerusalem in their elderly years to die in Jerusalem, that would, be, that would have been their desire. And then as they were there, maybe the husbands died first, and so they're in Jerusalem. And then they were in Jerusalem, and then these widows or others, they heard the message of the gospel, they accepted the Lord. And when that happened, once you became a Christian, that was it. You were cut off from any help from the Jewish religious leaders. You got nothing from the temple, you had no help, and there were no social services. And so if you were a widow, and you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you had no kind-hearted family members, you starved. That's it. You starved. Or you would beg to try to get a little bit. But you know, if they knew you, if they knew you were a Christian, Jews were not going to give you money. You're, you, you have left the faith. You're a heretic. And so it was a serious situation. So this feeding program, the distribution of food, literally it kept people alive, Christians. It kept them alive in desperate times. And so the Greek-speaking believers say, hey, our widows, we're being neglected. We're being overlooked. We're not, either we're not getting as much or we're not, we're not getting what the Hebrew-speaking widows are. And so we're going to talk about these two groups. So this was serious. It wasn't just, hey, he didn't do Christian portions. It, it was more life and death than that, okay? So here we have this, and I want us to look just very quickly at these two groups, and I want us to think about what the church was like, and I want us to think about discrimination just a little bit, because you know what? This is a big deal. This is not just a small thing. This is a really big, big deal. Look around at Lighthouse for just a minute and look at the various colors of skin at Lighthouse and think about our backgrounds. We're really a mixed, uh, we're really a mixed group and we've chosen to do that and we intend to continue doing it that way. It's not always easy. Sometimes we would be more comfortable in another way, but we have chosen from what we can understand as we look at the Word of God, we believe this is God's pattern and this is God's plan and this is what we're gonna do at Lighthouse. And we're gonna work on it and God's gonna work on us so that we love and we accept 
one another, those who are different from us, those who are of a different socioeconomic level, those that may be lower or higher in education than we are, but we're together in the church of God because the most important thing is that Jesus Christ has died for us. He's called us out of darkness. He's washed our sins and he's brought us into his family. And this is his family. Amen? Yeah. This is his family. Now, are there times... Now, you just heard us a little bit earlier say, okay, Bridget, your group is English speaking? Oh, discrimination. <laughs> Where this group is Taglish. There are times when, for sake of communication, that we have different, we have different groups and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. There, there, we, when we speak and when we communicate in the language of our heart, that's a good thing also. But this is a good thing as well. However, the early church did not look like us, brothers and sisters. The early church was one color. <laughs> they were Jewish. That's it. They were Jewish. That is all that they were. So what is this division right here, Greek speaking and Hebrew speaking? Let's look really quickly at the group so that we can understand. Okay, let's look at the next one. The, the Hebrew speaking or the Aramaic speaking, Aramaic was the language that um, all of those after the captivity, when they came back from Babylon, they, they began, and all that time, they learned to speak Aramaic. And it was very closely related to Hebrew or kind of a dialect of Hebrew in a way, in a way. Um, and so they were the Aramaic-speaking believers. Now let's find out a little bit about them. They were the majority group. Jesus and the 12 apostles were all Hebrew-speaking Jews. They were Aramaic. Much of what you see Jesus speak when it's recorded in the New Testament, Jesus spoke, it was Aramaic. It was Aramaic, okay? So this is what they spoke. They are the majority group. They were the old-timers. Some of you are old-timers of Lighthouse, right? You've been here from the very beginning. You're the old-timers. They were the old-timers, and not very old because it's a new church, right? Under a, year, under a year old. But they were the foundation of the, new, of, the, of the new church. They were born and they were raised in Palestine, in Israel, okay? And so they were much more traditional, and they had a strong Hebrew cultural influence. When they went to the synagogue, what Bible did they use? They used the Hebrew Old Testament. A lot of you went to the inspired exhibit, right? Yes. And we saw the Hebrew Old Testament. That's what they would have, that's what they would have read. And so this was the, uh, this was the Hebrew speaking or the Aramaic speaking group. And they were, it's important, they're the majority, okay? This is, gonna, this is gonna make more, this will be more significant as we look a little bit further. So here's the big group and the complaint has come against them. Let's look at the other group really quickly. The second group is the Greek-speaking group of believers. They're the minority group, okay? We don't know the percentages, but we know they're the minority group. They were raised outside of Palestine. In the, it was called the Diaspora when Jews had spread throughout the world after the captivity. Some came back to Palestine. Others were in other places. And they had been raised in places outside of Jerusalem and outside of Palestine. Guess what? That was Saul in part. That was Saul. He was Saul. He was of Tarsus, Cilicia. Okay? So outside. So although he was a strong, strong Hebrew, he was very, very strong, raised outside of Palestine and Greek cultural influence because in all of these areas in the years before that, Rome was in power now, but Greece had ruled the world at that time. And Greek language, Greek culture, Greek influence was so, so strong. Was so, so strong. And so these other these other Jews now, they had a Greek culture influence. When they went to the synagogue, what would they read? Not a Hebrew Old Testament. They would read the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, okay? And you heard about that in the expired, inspired exhibit. When did they come into the church? They were added to the church, all of them, after Pentecost. After the Holy Spirit was poured out and Peter and the, and the others stood up and began to preach the gospel. And then after that, so they came in, um, they were maybe pilgrims in Jerusalem. They had come for the Feast of Pentecost and they heard the message. They believed and they were added to the church. God added them to the church. And they were added after Pentecost. Who are some that we know that came from this group? Two that you know very well. Stephen, whom we will speak of just a little bit later. Stephen, uh, the first martyr, uh, the first Christian martyr. And then Philip, Philip the evangelist that we read about uh, later on in the book of Acts. Those are two famous ones. They were part of the Greek-speaking believers. So here are the two groups. Most importantly, one is the majority, 
one is the minority. So here we have these two groups. And the complaint comes finally from them to them. It starts out as a, as a murmur, but fortunately it comes out very quickly. One of the most damaging things to the church of God, the family of God, is when there is a complaint or a dissatisfaction and it becomes a murmur and it stays a murmur for a long time as it begins to spread. And then it finally comes out and it damages the church. When there are a lot of times when there are things in the church you think this is not right or why is this this way don't give in to murmuring bring it out deal with it if you need to go to the pastors go to the board go to the elders go to those that you respect who are mature in the Lord and say there's this I, I, I I'm struggling with this rather than letting it be a poison that fills the church and so fortunately the Greek speaking believers come up with it and they say hey our widows are being discriminated against now I want you to notice something I trust this has never happened at Lighthouse maybe it has but I trust not have you ever been part of a church or a group where you felt I'm in the minority and I am being in, in church in, in church I'm in the minority and I am being discriminated against what is it's not right and it's not fair the balance is not right this is not good I don't like this it should never be that way in the church of God it is that way in the world because the way of the world is always the way of power whoever's in the majority I'm boss I decide what's done. I choose how it is. Minority, tough luck. You just have to take it. Whatever we say, that's what you have to do. That's the world's way, brothers and sisters. It is never God's way, as we're going to see this morning. And God, help us and keep Lighthouse ever, ever from letting that be part of our hearts and, and part of the, 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 the family of God. It destroys the family of God. And so they come out. And so here we have this threat to the church. And so let's look at this. Um, let's look at the next slide. And let's see what happens. What do they do? What they do is they call a business meeting. How many of you love, you know at Lighthouse, it's so great. We have only one business meeting a year. The board meets more. Um, but you know, even at Lighthouse, the board we don't have monthly meetings for hours and hours. We try to take care of business on the fourth floor at, at others or whatever. How many of you, your favorite service of the year is our annual general meeting, the AGM? You, when we announce it, you look forward to it. You, you just make sure you're going to be at Lighthouse on that day. Yes? Nobody loves a business meeting, not even the pastors. But we have to because we are good citizens in the, in the, uh, uh, the city-state of Hong Kong. And so they call a business meeting because they've got to handle it. And what do they, and I want, to, I want you to see something as we look at this. This is what they're going to do. And they're going to do it in a good way, in a godly way. And this is going to help us this morning. First of all, I want you to notice that they don't settle all the details. They don't say, okay, now let's see exactly what is happening. Is there discrimination? Is there this? Is there that? They don't even get into all of that. And do you know what? If you will read several Bible translations, you will find that we don't know was there unintentional discrimination? Because you know what, brothers and sisters? We come into the church of God and we are who we are and our backgrounds are that and we're certain cultures and sometimes there just is discrimination isn't there yes or no yes there is and we don't recognize it already always so when we do recognize it we go to God and we say God I don't want to be this way because I'm your child I'm in a family with others who belong to you as well so sometimes it's unintentional if there was discrimination it was unintentional these are godly people who are growing together. So there may have been unintentional discrimination. Or the Greek-speaking group may have looked and they may have thought there was discrimination, but there wasn't any. That is also possible. And interestingly enough, the Bible does not tell us which one was which. Does not. Does not. Nevertheless, it's a threat and it's a problem. So they call a meeting, and this is what they're going to do in the meeting. This is a great meeting. This is a great meeting. If you want to look at this, this is a spiritual sandwich, okay? Take a quick look. 
here's a spiritual sandwich. And you say, what do you mean? What we have is here, the 12, and they talk about themselves, what they should and should not be doing. And then they come down here and they say, this is what we should be doing. And then in the middle is the meat of the sandwich. And this is how they're going to solve the problem. Okay? So it's a spiritual sandwich. So let's look first at the bread of the sandwich. Let's look at what the apostles say. They say it would not be right for us apostles to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm not careful, I look at that as a minister and I say, hmm, I'm so special. I don't wait on tables. I'm a minister. Is that what is meant here at all? Absolutely not. It is absolutely not the case. Like, we are so important. We don't do that. You do that. That is not what is said here. And we need to understand that. What the apostles say instead is this. God has called us to the ministry of the Word. God has gifted us in the ministry of the Word. That is our responsibility. If, we, if our time is taken up by meeting this need instead and waiting on tables, and you, they have to wait on the tables, the widows have to be fed or they will starve. But the, the apostles say, if our time is diverted to that, then we who have been called to the ministry of the word and prayer cannot do what God has called us to do. That's not right. So do we just say, ha, swanla, forget it? That's not right either. In God's church, where there are needs, listen carefully, I believe with all of my heart, in God's church, we are God's church. It's not my church, oh, Pastor Jennifer's church, Pastor Renee's church. It's not our church, although there is the sense that it's my church in a good way. But this is God's church. I didn't die for this church and give my life for this church. Jesus did it. It's His church. And in the church of God, when there is a need, because God loves us as His church, as His family, as His children, He does not let us go needy. He does not. What kind of a parent would you be if your child in your home is hungry and thirsty and you just let them sit there hungry and thirsty. You would be a wicked, uncaring parent to do that. How much more would God in His church see needs that are there and not provide for those needs? Amen? And so the application for me as we look at this and as we look at Lighthouse, as there are needs in Lighthouse, and there are needs in Lighthouse, God provides for the needs because it's His church. We are His church. But God does not always provide the needs through the pastors of Lighthouse. He does not. He does not. Pastors have a role and a responsibility, but it's not the only part of a church. Sometimes, uh, a few months ago, somebody came and said to me, Pastor Jennifer, we like our small groups, but when are the pastors going to teach a Bible study again? And we did recently. Pastor Renee led a Bible study. But may I tell you something? If you only look to Pastor Renee and Pastor Jennifer to be the ones who teach, 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 Lighthouse will not be what it's supposed to be. We have looked in this church and we have recognized mature believers who have teaching gifts in small groups who are called of God to, to use their gifts to meet the needs of the church, to meet the needs of the church. And so that's why in this Bible study again, Sister Bridget stood up, Julie stood up, Ida stood up, Cindy stood up. And you know what I think? I personally think there should be some others who have it on their heart. You know who you are, because I think God has spoken. I believe there are others that God has been stirring your heart. Lord, I believe you're calling me to step out in this area. Not because you are so great. Not because you are so smart. But because there are needs in His church. And because God loves us. 
He touches the hearts of people and he gives his gifts. It's not ours. It's his gifts from heaven and they're spiritual gifts. And he puts them in his people and he equips us to meet the needs of other people in the church. That's what a healthy church is. That's what a healthy church does. That's one of the reasons Pastor Renee also has guitar classes to encourage, um, to encourage the music ministry and worship. You know what? In the Philippines right now, there are pastors of churches and, and leaders of small groups that lead worship in their church. And, and, the, and the, the churches began with a group as they led worship because Brother Bob Okemo of Kenya, who was part of Lighthouse for many, many years, had guitar classes and taught a whole group of sisters how to play the guitar. And it was so bad in the beginning, but taught them. And it was in their hearts. And then God took them back to the Philippines. And then God took their desire and some of that gifting, but then he gave them his gifting. And out of that came great fruitfulness. This is how the church of God works. And so the apostles say, this is where we need to spend our time. If, as a pastor, I am tempted to take care of the busy work of Lighthouse, Pastor Renee and I, this has to be done, that has to be done. And of course, when there's a medical mission or summer English camp, there's a lot that has to be done. But if our primary time and attention is diverted from ministry of the word and prayer, then when I stand before you, when I stand before you on Sunday morning with this message that I have prepared, but I'm not prepared, I'm not prepared, then what you receive will be less than what God has for you this day. There will not be the life-giving force of the Holy Spirit and you will receive weak, nutritious, spiritual food. And you will be the less for it. And the church will be the less for it. We have a responsibility. We all have responsibilities. And so the apostles say, this is where we must do. Before that time, the apostles had been doing it. They didn't mean we're too good to wait on tables because literally they're going to wait on tables. But they've been doing it because it has to be done. But they say, we will turn this responsibility over to them. That means we've been doing it. Now we're going to hand it over. Now we're going to hand it over. I tell you, it does my heart good when there's something that I have been doing that I think, Lord, surely you are calling somebody else to do it. And he has. And then that respons responsibility is passed on to them. It will be a healthier church. God never designed. Listen, I don't care that Lighthouse pays our salary and provides our rent and our health coverage every month. God has never intended the pastors to do everything in the church. And I'm not saying that because I want to be lazy and rest a little bit more. That is not God's plan. God sees this church. He loves this church. And because He loves this church, He knows we have needs. And because of that, in each one of us, He puts equipping and gifts for the needs of the church. That's God's way. That's God's way. And when the church works as God designs and plans, it will be a healthy church and it will be a growing church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now here's the solution to the problem. He says, and so they say, and so brothers, select seven men. Okay, stop right there. I'm offended. Why men? Are they, pre are they discriminating against women? No. No. They're not discriminating against women. But remember, it was a Jewish church, Jewish culture at that time. It was within the Jewish cultural bounds. Women would not have been in leadership in that way and certainly would not have been working in the community. It would not have been done. And so as it starts out, it works within the framework that they have. Choose seven men from among you who are well respected and are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. Then we'll turn it over to them. And so here we see the solution to the problem. And so let's look at this and we read this. Now, let's see what these people should be like. Are these deacons yet? Not yet. Not yet. At Lighthouse we have a board and the board functions as a deacon board, which includes this, but it's more than this. And if the, light, if the board of Lighthouse doesn't carry 
the burden and meet the needs that the board should, then the church suffers also. That's, that's the picture that we see in the Bible. So what are the responsibilities of these seven? Let's look at that really quickly. First of all, the servants must be, and you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, why don't you put a nicer title there for these men who are going to be so important? Can't put a different title because that's what the Bible says they were. That's what the Bible says they were. So the servants must be, first of all, from among them. What does that mean? Don't go hire somebody from outside who is a specialist in food distribution, no, in food, food sciences. That's what they call it in America. Don't go outside of the church and hire somebody in food sciences that is an expert and knows what to do. Why? It's God's church and God meets the needs of his church from the gifts he gives the people who are in the church and then they exercise those gifts. Amen? Amen. So from among them, so there's an observable, observable life and character. You've got to know what these people are like. You've got to know what their hearts are like. Are they humble? Are they willing to serve? Do they have a good heart? Or will they get proud in this position? So observable character from among them. Secondly, full of the Holy Spirit. Wait, stop right there. Full of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Jennifer, the only thing they're going to do is wait on tables. They're waiters. They're waiters. They have to be full of the Holy Spirit? Yes, they have to be full of the Holy Spirit. Why? It is God's work in God's church, and so they have to be full of the Holy Spirit, strengthened to serve by the power of the Holy Spirit. They have to have the gifts that come from the Holy Spirit to do this work because it's going to be sensitive work, isn't it? There are people who have their feelings hurt right now. I've been, I've been discriminated against. What, what, what about me? You're going to have to handle it carefully. And they have to be under the control of the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit will direct them. They have to be full of the Holy Spirit. I encourage you right now, what gifting has God given you? What calling? Has your heart, is your heart being stirred in certain areas? I spoke with somebody in this last week who said to me, I feel that God is calling me to and she filled in the blank, and I, I agree, and I feel that. But I believe also there, all of us, not I believe, let me say it another way, the Bible is very clear on this. God gives each one of us gifts for all of us. And so God stirs our heart, God speaks to us, and then we do these things that God has called us to do. We begin to use the gifts that He has given us, and guess what, brothers and sisters? It has to be in the power of the Holy Spirit has to be in the gifting of the Holy Spirit. If not, I will get tired and impatient with you while I'm doing my work for the church and for the family. If not, I will get discouraged and give up because whew, sometimes I'm working for the church and people, they just don't appreciate what I'm doing. Do they know how hard I work? Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> sure, sure. May I tell you something? In some ways, the pastor's job, in a way, is the most glorious job. But don't take that the wrong way. Take it the right way. Everybody sees us. We're in the front. We stand up and we do things. May I tell you that the church of God works and runs and moves through the giftings of people that you will seldom see standing in the front. And it's honoring to God. And it requires that. It requires that. There are people who pray and pray and pray, and God has called them in that so that this church is growing and healthy. Listen, there are people, after you and I are long gone on Sunday afternoon, that come down here to the second floor, and they vacuum, and they empty the trash, and they clean the chairs. And it's not because they are domestic helpers, and that's what they should do. It is because this is their church and they're serving the Lord and serving us in this way. Amen? Amen. And so they must be full of the Holy Spirit. And finally, they must be full of wisdom. And you say, well, I'm pretty smart. Can I do it? I, I've, my IQ is pretty high and I have a lot of experience. How about me? Nope, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says full of wisdom. And wisdom, biblical wisdom, comes from God. It's a gift from Him. Through, in His people, through His people. 
and it is the spiritual application of knowledge in specific situations as needed. This was going to be a tough problem to solve. There was a major majority and a minority. People's feelings were hurt. And how many of us, when our feelings are hurt, we're just, our feelings are already hurt, we're just looking for the next, war next person that's going to hurt us, right? The next person that's going to say something. See? <laughs> See, I'm right. Now, we're laughing a little bit, but is that not true? It's, it is so true. The people who were going to administer this food program, they were going to have the wisdom, of, they, they'd have to have the wisdom of the Lord to handle this. If not, the church was going to split. If not, harm was going to come. And you, and you and I, this morning, would be in a very different situation if that had happened in the church. And so, that's what it had to be. Now, how will the church respond? And let's see the response in Acts, 5, in Acts 6, 5 and 6. Oh, praise the Lord, everyone liked this idea. Aren't you glad? You know why everyone liked this idea? It was God's idea. <laughs> It was God's idea. It was God's plan. Listen, brothers and sisters, I don't always know it, and you don't always know it, but let me tell you something. Are you facing a problem? You're facing a need? You don't know what to do? God always has a plan. God always has a plan. He has never left, what shall I do? Mm. God always has a plan. The key is getting locked in with God and saying, God, what is your plan? And walking in step with Him. And then in obedience so that the plan is worked out. So everybody liked this idea and they chose the following. Who did they cho choose? Stephen. Stephen means crown. And we'll talk about him the next time we come to this. Um, and it is a crown. So think about it because you already know about Stephen. It is a crown not that is from royalty. Oh, you're the son of the king and so you receive a crown. No. This name, Stephen, meant the crown of victory. It was an earned crown. How meaningful that Stephen, the first martyr of the church, had that name. It's an earned crown through martyrdom as we see that. So Stephen, and I like this, Luke says, full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Hey, who's the next one? Philip. Philip. Do you know what Philip means? Philip? Philip means, it's Greek, and it means lover of horses. No, spirit, no great spiritual meaning there that I know of or whatever, but lover of horses. And right now we stop and we say, well, I know Stephen and I know Philip, right? Why do we know Stephen and Philip? Because both of them began as waiters in the church of God, but were faithful and humble in duty, full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and greater doors of ministry opened. Listen. God will always open greater doors of ministry when you are faithful in the area and the gifting that He has first called you to and the <coughs> gifting He has first given you. Always. Always. Who are the others? I'm not sure about these names. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch. Uh, the only one who was Greek and then converted first to Judaism and then believed in Jesus. That, that's what that means there. And they were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Now we come to a close this morning very quickly in just a few more minutes. But I want to ask you how your Greek is this morning. Uh, let me give you some examples of some things. Uh, Lamgit. I know somebody named Lamgit. What type of person is that person? What, 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 what uh, ethnic group? Lamgi. Chinese la. <laughs> yeah, Lamgi. How am I? Shuang Mu, San Dian Shui, Nega, Lamgi. Okay? So if you heard the word Lamgi, you say, oh, Chinese person. How about, how about, <laughs> Alma Gabai? <laughs> what nationality? Very clear. Filipino. Or. Okay. Now these are two examples for you. Look at these names. Put on your Greek speaking hat and guess what you find out. These names are all Greek. They're all Greek. Every one of them. Every one of them. Whew. What does this tell us as we come to this solution to the problem? This godly solution and the meeting of the need. The church chose the minority group, people from the minority, all of them, all seven of them. They trusted them enough. They humbled themselves. 
before their brothers who were in the minority group to trust them. You are godly. You take in your hands the responsibility of giving food to everybody, not just the Greek-speaking widows, but the Hebrew, Aramaic-speaking wid widows as well. We trust you. We know your character. Now that's the church of God working as the church of God should do. How opposite is that to the way of the world? The way of the world, we're the majority, we keep the power. We'll do better. We'll do right. We'll make sure you're not, you're, you're not uh, discriminated or ignored anymore. You'll get your Christian portion. No. They humbly choose Greek-speaking servants to oversee everybody. And it works because we never hear the problem again. Brothers and sisters, this is how it works in the church of God, in the family of God when He gives gifts. Isn't God so good? that he gifted these seven men to meet this need. Really, really, God is so good. And they presented them to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Now, since they did it God's way, what is the result? And we close with this this morning, Acts 6, 7. So God's message continued to spread. What if that majority Hebrew-speaking group had said, we're going to keep the power for ourselves. After all, we're the old-timers. We know best. All the rest of you, you're a little too liberal for us because you're Greek-speaking. We're going to do it. We'll handle it. We'll take care of you. Don't worry. Nope. They did it God's way. They did it God's way. And so, the message, God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem. And many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Do you know why I like this part right here as we come to a close this morning? Do you know why I think it ends with the Jewish priests being converted? Who were the servants in the temple in Jerusalem? Who? The priests. The priests as they went about their duty. I must do this. They lorded it over others or they grumbled about the work that they had to do. And they had before them the example of a different way of service in the family of God. Men who chose to faithfully and humbly submit to one another out of love because of God serving one another. And the number of Jewish priests greatly increased. That's why I think that's there, and that ends this section. Brothers and sisters, God has a good way to run His church. If there are needs right now in Lighthouse, we need to be praying about them. Should we be meeting that need? If so, God will stir your heart and gift you for that need, but then you have to be willing and sacrificially give of yourself and of time. That's what it takes. Because listen, waiting on tables for 10,000 people, not that many widows, but a bunch of them, you think that was easy work? That was hard work. You think that was glorious work? No. Was it needed work? It was needed. And so God gifted people, just as He does and has and will in the church of God that is called Lighthouse. Let's close in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for Acts chapter 6. And we thank you for these seven servants whom we will meet one day in heaven. Lord willing. Stephen and Philip and these others. Father, may their message, may their, their lives and their service and ministry be an encouragement and a challenge to us. Lord, I pray for Pastor Renee and for me and for others who lead in the ministry of the Word that what the apostles said and determined would also be a challenge to us as we give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Lord, each one of us, I pray in Lighthouse, Lord, that we would respond to You and use the giftings that You have put in our lives to meet the needs of our church. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen, amen. amen.